Odo Beckham Jr., we last saw him week seven of the 2020 season, tore an ACL while making a tackle after an interception. Week one, he was kind of like a game day, not necessarily game time, but a game day call. Then week two, he was scratched as of Wednesday. Week three, things seem to be pointing in the direction of Odo Beckham Jr. playing when the Bears come to town. They need him, Peter, because Jarvis Landry is on injured reserve with an MCL injury. Two different styles of receivers, but still, one of your most important weapons is out. You need another weapon on the field for Baker Mayfield. And I don't know what to expect from the Browns offense with Beckham back in the mix. The one thing I hope for is that they finally get away from this kind of Randy ratio mindset where we got to get the ball to Odell Beckham Jr. We got to find a way to force it to him. We got, Hey, if you want to hand it off to him, you want to do a jet sweep, put him in the backfield, do a bubble screen, that's fine. But they, they need to once and for all, and I think they are. I think they are. In 2019, it was a problem. Last year, I think they began the process of getting away from this obsession with forcing the ball to Odo Beckham Jr. down the field, regardless of whether he's covered or not. That was only leading to bad places for the Browns, Peter, and hopefully they won't do that when he returns, if it's Sunday or if it's later in the season. I kind of hope Kevin Stefanski uh, read the numbers game section of my column on Monday. And uh, this is not a humble brag. It's a brag. (laughs) On on Monday in my column, I had the stats of Odell Beckham uh, playing and not playing. And what happens when he plays for the Browns? And what happens when he doesn't play? And when, when he plays, Cleveland's 11 and 12, and they average 22 points a game. When he doesn't play, Cleveland is 8-5 and five and averages 26 points a game. And this is not to say that Odell Beckham is not valuable. That's not what that means. What it means is precisely what you just said. Stop being obsessed with having to get Odell Beckham the ball. Make him a natural part of the offensive game flow. And now, look, without uh, Jarvis Landry, and look, suppose that Kevin Stefanski says, okay, 65 offensive snaps in this game, Odell's playing 30. Because just remember, I I think there is a hidden guy in this offense. He's not hidden. But Donovan Peoples-Jones is a guy who Baker Mayfield clearly feels an affinity to in this offense. You know, and he understands that even without Jarvis Landry, there are other options for him. They've got a great tight end group. Don't say, okay, Odell's playing 32 snaps in this game. He's getting 13 targets. Don't do that. Don't do right. that. And I think we both agree. Yep. The, the play is very simple. It's what Tom Brady's doing in Tampa Bay. You drop back, you start to go through your reads. If the first guy's open, you throw it to him. If he's not, you go to the second guy. If he's open, you throw it to him. If he's not, you go to the third guy. If he's open, you throw it to him. You put the ball where it's supposed to go on every given play, and whoever it is that happens to be the one to catch it, good for him. But that's how you keep your guys from getting upset. That's how you keep the offense from getting a skew. And that's the key. The Saints offense got a skew on Sunday against the Carolina Panthers. Let's talk about this one for a minute, Peter. Saints and Patriots. Yeah. Patriots getting ready for Tom Brady to come to town. They get Jameis Winston before that. Jameis Winston has faced Bill Belichick one other time and was not horrible. Jameis Winston was not good on Sunday against the Panthers. And I just assume Belichick's going to take that film of what the Panthers did to take away the run get Jameis Winston off his mark, get him to try to be Patrick Mahomes, and everyone, I think including Jameis Winston, realizes he's not Patrick Mahomes and and hope for a similar outcome. But I think this is the worst possible team that the Saints could be playing with Winston after getting completely shut down because here comes a coach who's going to be able to carbon copy exactly what happened and try to do it again. Hey, Mike, in in an eight-day period, first against Tampa Bay – and then, or first against, sorry, against New Orleans and then against Tampa Bay. I think the most important player on the field for the Patriots is going to be Josh Uche. The speed rusher, last year's uh, second round pick out of Michigan. And the reason that I think Uche is going to be so important in this game plan is very, very simple. I want you to think about something. When you look at the New England Patriots and how they affect an offense Okay, 
They need speed around the corner to do that. And Josh Uche has shown sparks and signs. You have two basically, I, I don't want to call uh, Jameis Winston immobile. He, he, he can get around when he needs to. Tom Brady's immobile. And that is what that is why you need a guy who's going to come around the edge very fast. And in my opinion, you're absolutely right. You know, the Patriots are going to be uber focused on stopping Alvin Kamara. Bill Belichick has a long history of saying, Marshall Falk, we're going to take you out of this game. And that's how they won their first Super Bowl. And you go over time, all the time that he said, Edger and James, you're not going to beat us. So those are the kind of things that I think are going through the Patriots' head right now. You're right. They will be focused on stopping Kamara. And then after that, they will be focused on really chasing Jameis Winston around. And that's why I think Josh Uche is a huge factor. And then when they get through that game, it's full and complete focus on the return of Tom Brady to New England, a topic that I have a feeling we will be addressing on more than one occasion next week. Chargers Chiefs get together, both teams one and one. The loser is in the basement of the AFC West after three weeks of the season because the Raiders and Broncos are both 2-0, and potentially on their way each to 3-0. and Can the Chargers... Yeah, and look, the injuries are already popping up again. Joey Bosa hasn't been practicing. Der Derwin James is on the injury list. We, you know, the Chargers, if they could just keep all their guys healthy, would be unstoppable. Um, Chiefs look a little vulnerable. Chargers are are a good team, maybe not as good as I thought they were going to be after that loss to the Cowboys, but we'll see. Do you think they can they can steal a game from the Chiefs in Kansas City? Well, Mike, last year. Uh, as you know, Justin Herbert started twice against the Kansas City Chiefs. He beat them once, and it's hard to call that a very meaningful game because the Chiefs weren't trying to win in Week 17. But, you know, I will just say this. Justin Herbert had 113.6 rating in those two games. He put up 59 points on Kansas City. Right now, I, I'm not saying that over the next 10 years that Justin Herbert will be what Tom Brady was to Patrick Mahomes. But this is going to be a great, great rivalry over the next 10 to 15 years. And I'm not saying it's going to be Marino Elway or anything like that. I'm just saying that of all, if you look at all the divisions in football right now, right now, and you say, what is the best quarterback rivalry in any division? I mean, not that it's happened yet, you know, over a long period of time. Over the next 10 years, the best quarterback rivalry in football in any division is going to be Patrick Mahomes versus Justin Herbert. I agree with you completely. Absolutely. And I think I heard Chuck. I think I heard a quick little bark from Chuck. That Chuck is in the background, playing Mike. tricks on me. I heard Chuck. I like yeah. Chuck. Always good to have a little a Chuck little, is uh, there. I think he's Chuck. waiting for me to take him out. Yeah. <laughs> got to hurry up um, with the show. I, I, but I agree with you completely. You know, the, the, the best quarterback rivalries are the ones that play out in the postseason, and it's difficult to do that when you're in the same division. But when you're in the same division, difficult, you're guaranteed but not to get impossible. two of them every year. Not impossible, not impossible. But, you know, one of the things that made Brady and Manning what it was, both teams were were dominating their divisions during their tenures, which made it more likely in any given year slash every given year they'd get together in January. That's what made that rivalry. Russell Wilson and Kirk Cousins has not been much of a rivalry. The Seahawks have pretty much owned the Vikings in recent years. The Vikings, though, get to go home. First home game, first game with fans since the 2019 season. They're going to need that crowd to make a difference. The defense has been prone to lapses this year, giving up big plays. The Seahawks are prone to getting some big plays. Can the Vikings get away from their 0-2 start, finally getting that Seahawk off their back? You know what is so interesting about this particular rivalry? Mike, did you know that a Kirk Cousins, Russell Wilson college football game made the Seattle Seahawks choose Russell Wilson in the 2012 draft. Remember, let's go back to 2011. 
It, we're coming up on the 10-year anniversary of the Big Ten Championship game at Lucas Oil Stadium in Indianapolis. Michigan State with Kirk Cousins against Russell Wilson and his Wisconsin Badgers. Wilson, it's a huge shootout in the game. Wilson ends up winning the game at the end. John Schneider, the Seattle GM, is scouting the game that night and after the game goes to the hotel where the Wisconsin families and, and team are at and they're all celebrating. He meets the family of Russell Wilson and he loved him as a player. And then he really got to love the roots that made Russell Wilson. And he gets to know people in the family and he comes back and he tells Pete Carroll, <clears throat> and this is a this is a made-for-TV movie over-dramatization that I am basically inventing. But he basically went back <laughs> to Seattle after that game and said to Pete Carroll, hey, Pete, we got our quarterback. You know, I just saw him on Saturday night in Indianapolis. We got to take Russell Wilson. We got to find a way. And so, obviously, the next year, Jacksonville Jaguars at number 70 take a punter, Brian Anger. The Seattle Seahawks at number 75 Take a quarterback, Russell Wilson, and the rest is history for both franchises. But, but Peter, Peter, you got to cut the Jaguars some slack here. After all, they had Blaine Gabbert at the time. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. <laughs> you rest your case. <laughs> hey, he's the most underrated player in all of football, according to Bruce Arians. Uh, and he said it with a straight face. Yeah, yeah. Packers 49ers on Sunday night football. Green Bay had a couple of misadventures at Levi's Stadium in 2019 when the 49ers were firing on all cylinders. Last year, the Packers won there in large part because the 49ers were decimated. We talked about this on a video that we did for Yahoo Sports on Tuesday, and we're on the same page. Successfully punching your punching bag, that is the Detroit Lions, does not prove that everything is fixed with the Green Bay Packers. If they want us to forget about whatever it was that they offered up week one, they got to go to San Francisco and beat the 49ers. They do that, then we say, okay, it was a fluke, it was an aberration, it wasn't real week one. They go out there and they, they do what they did in 2019 twice, and that defense looks susceptible to giving up 37 again to the 49ers. They do that, and, and the, the fire is still raging at Lambeau Field. You know, Mike, the bottom line in all of this is the Green Bay Packers are going to need more than Aaron Rodgers and an offense that can put up 30 points a game. They're going to need more than that to win and to go far into the playoffs this year. Without Zadarius Smith... That is problematic, and it will be problematic against a good but not great offense, you know, in San Francisco. But you're right. Two years ago, they got drubbed twice when they went to Levi's Stadium. This is their fourth game in 22 months at Levi's Stadium. It should almost feel like a second home to them. But I, I just, my biggest question coming into this is, I think Aaron Rodgers is going to have to win a shootout. He can. He definitely can, but I, I think Aaron, Aaron Rodgers holds the fate of this game in his hands. I think he's got to score 34 points for the Packers to win. And if they lose, they will be, and I know how much you love this stat. This is why I'm mentioning it. They will be 1-6 in, in California and Florida and 29-4 and four everywhere else in the universe under Matt LaFleur. Yeah. You like that stat. You deep down you like you I don't really want to admit stat. and I use that it. you like that stat. Mike, I use it all the time because it's yeah, it's I'm sure so you do. Perfect. Yeah. It means I'm sure. so I'm sure it you means did. so much. I scoured every word of football morning in America in search of it on Monday, and maybe I just hadn't had my coffee yet. 